exciting. Nice to meet you. Ivan Blasquez here. Yeah, nice to meet you. And your study caught my attention, so could you just uh, briefly share with us kind of what you found and and what you were looking for? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so we, I'm interested in microparticles, which are these shed uh, vesicles released by a cell under conditions of stress and, and apoptosis and, and, and various stimuli. Um, and they can have both biomarker functions, so they can be marker of cell stress or disease, disease severity, depending on your population. Mm -hmm. uh, and they can also have bioeffective functions, so they can be mediators of cell signaling and, and understanding the processes. Um, and we're quite interested in how uh, aerobic exercise affects the number and uh, functional capacity of these cells. Circulating microvesicles are small, membrane-enclosed structures that are released into the extracellular space by a variety of cell types, including endothelial cells, epithelial cells, platelets, and additionally, tumor cells. Once released from the cell, circulating microvesicles can be detected in a variety of body fluids, including urine and in the blood. Each circulating microvesicle contains proteins and RNAs that are representative of its cell of origin, including surface and cytoplasmic proteins, messenger RNA, and microRNAs. Because the molecular content of a circulating microvesicle reflects its cell of origin, biomarkers from the cell of origin can be exploited through circulating microvesicles to detect the presence of a disease. So what we did, we did a very simple study. We took 15 uh, male kind of student age people, yep. uh, did an exercise trial, which was an hour of running at six, uh, 60 minutes at 7% VO2 max uh, versus a no exercise control trial. They were running for 60 minutes? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So what was the intensity? Relatively, relatively fit. So 70% VO2 max. Yeah, so yeah. it's a pretty, pretty decent, yeah, that's uh, moving. Pretty decent exercise trial. And uh, versus a no exercise resting control trial. Okay. Um, and we took blood samples pre exercise, post exercise, and an hour and a half post exercise. What we did is on those three time points, we did flow cytometry analysis of microparticles. Um, and what we were looking at is total microparticle number, uh -huh. um, and then microparticle number from various different cell types. So we have neutrophils, monocytes, endothelial cells, and platelets. Uh, and each, on each of those four cell types, we're also looking at tissue factor expression, which is a, uh, huh. a, a protein that can facilitate thrombosis. Wow. Um, and this is all kind of also connected with uh, inflammatory response? Yes, yeah, yeah. So and what, I'm so primarily interested in inflammation, so this is a kind of another avenue of which exercise can... can and, like. and, and what was found? So what we found, as expected, we saw an increase in total microparticle number after exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, primarily that's just because during exercise you get a hemodynamic stress caused by increased blood flow. Okay. Which effectively act activates the cells, stresses the cells, and they, yes. they, these microparticles burst out. Um, Acutely, it's, it's an acute, acute yeah, yeah. yeah, it's an acute effect. Um, uh, more interestingly, what we did see in the um, total microparticles and neutral and platelet-derived microparticles, what we saw was a decrease in the percentage of those particles expressing tissue factor. So we're going from around 40% in the pre-exercise trials to around 20-25% in the post-exercise trials. Uh, and we think that represents a reduction in the ability of these cells to induce thrombosis. We wow. haven't done a, a functional thrombin assay, unfortunately, which right. is the, the next step in that one. That Correct. One. Um, so, yeah, what we think we're seeing is a very nice anti-inflammatory, anti-thrombotic effect on this exercise. Wow. Uh, the next step for us would be to take this on to some patient populations and do some clinical exercise research as well. Oh, really, sure. Really investigate the populations that would actually be at risk of thrombosis. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, yeah. Gotcha. And yeah. this was in a healthy population, so yeah. you don't want to move this, on and yeah. test this in a population exactly. that is higher risk for exactly. thrombosis. So my, my area of research which Which would be therapeutic. Is, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I'm primarily interested in renal disease populations, okay. mostly dialysis patients, huh. um, which obviously do have you know, elevated thrombosis and coagulation and atherosclerosis wow. way beyond the healthy population. So 
All right, we'll sir. To investigate whether this is an avenue. Patrick, thank you very much. Thank you. Was this for your doctorate or? Uh, yeah, master's? yeah. I'm a final year PhD student. Oh, so okay, yeah. fantastic. So, Doctor Heighton, then. Hopefully soon. Yeah, give well. Me si give me six months. Okay. All right. Well, when you see this video, it'll be hindsight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you'll right. be a doctor, and yeah. you'll say, "All right, it was cool." Exactly. All right, thanks. It's me. All right, you guys. So, I got a lot of content for today. Today's uh, Wednesday and it's day two. So I'm going to share with you guys uh, some of the notes which I have in my phone right here. So the first, uh, it was a memorial lecture and it was on uh, physical activity and how it could uh, prevent cancer and be involved in the cancer treatment. Okay, so for women the top three most common cancers are breast cancer, lung cancer, and colon and rectal cancer. And for men it's prostate, lung, and colon, and, and, uh, and, and, and rectal cancer. Uh, there are over 100 cancers, and um, there are. She also proposed there, like there was a schematic of mechanisms of physical activity that may prevent cancer, such as uh, reducing estrogens. Particularly, this is in uh, you know for women and breast cancer risk. The exercise can reduce um, excess estrogens. It also reduces inflammation. And uh, also, uh, C-reactive protein is associated with breast cancer. So having higher levels of that, um, you know, of that in, of that biomarker are associated with higher levels of a uh, higher risk of breast cancer. C-peptide, which is I uh, wrote down an insulin derivative, or it's related with insulin, uh, is associated with colorectal cancer. So having higher levels of the C-peptide. My name is Nigel Brunskill. I'm Professor of Renal Medicine at the University of Leicester. I'm a clinical academic and I look after patients with kidney disease. Well, C-peptide is a partner to insulin that's released from the pancreas at the same time as insulin. So the pancreas makes insulin as a larger molecule called pro-insulin. And before it can be released into the bloodstream, it has to be broken down. And when pro-insulin is broken down, it releases insulin and C-peptide. Um, adiponectin, as I've talked about in my videos, guys, fat loss. Adiponectin, uh, having higher levels, decrease the risk of pancreatic cancer. And also exercise serves to decrease angiogenesis, especially with fat loss or, or increase in VO2 max, which is really fascinating. Kind of goes in hand with my videos, boosting VO2 max and, and, and fat loss, uh, you know, naturally raises metabolic rate. Well, here we're, we're showing that it can decrease angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is a little bit kind of a, kind of a paradox or kind of a catch-22 because it's, we, we need some angiogenesis, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but also um, I think excess or just, I guess it depends on where it's located, you know. Um, angiogenesis and, and abnormal tissue, obviously, is we don't want that. Uh, exercise serves to reduce that. Prolactin is a, uh, a, another biomarker related with breast cancer risk and that uh, prolactin is decreased if VO2 max is increased greater than 5%. Um, so let's move on. So there are low and moderate and high responders uh, when it comes to building muscle. Um, essentially, it has to do with genetics. Some people walk in uh, with just a, a better, a better profile to build muscle, and uh, also uh, he. Uh, there was a mention of myostatic downregulation happens in both, um, you know, um, obese and, and, and lean populations, but that this is not as much of an influence on muscle hypertrophy as once thought. Um, unloading, or uh, you know, basic unloading like taking weight off or bed rest uh, decreases protein synthesis and um, proteasome activity uh, particularly beta 5 is increased uh, in unloading or, or disuse which is you know, obviously leads to atrophy uh, the FOXO1 and the FOXO3 gene this is what Dr. Rhonda Patrick mentions in her videos but it's kind of a catch-22 you know those FOXO the, the, the FOXO pathways upregulated when we're on autophagy, right? 
Well, it's also upregulated when, when we have atrophy. So that's the autophagy caveat, caveat. Atrophy is the autophagy caveat. So I've proposed and I've made videos about how we can feast and be an autophagy, but also I propose that we don't have to have atrophy to be an autophagy. And I think there's still a lot to be learned. There's still a, not, a lot that needs to be learned in regards to this. But I believe that we can, we can partition autophagy. I mean, we can have autophagy in our brain and our, in our liver and organs, but we can, and we can have it in our muscle. But again, autophagy, we need autophagy to have muscle. I talked about that before. But excessive autophagy has been shown to promote protein degradation as well as self-cannibalization. I've, I've alluded to that in previous videos. So I think a balance here is really what's, what's, what's the take-home message.